XCOM is one of my favourite game franchises of all time. It's got it all. Tense, tactical combat, deep strategic gameplay, and a wide variety of- Oh, come on! That was a 95% shot! Ah, oh, this game is rigged! <clears throat> After playing through War of the Chosen, the new expansion for XCOM 2, I was struck by just how well the game managed to constantly keep me on my toes and never let me get complacent. I was constantly juggling, dealing with new tech, some crazy new kind of alien, or the fallout of one of my best guys getting killed. In XCOM, there's this really awesome feeling of an arms race between you and the aliens. You start off facing advent troopers and the occasional sectoid with rookies, but by the end of the game, you're taking down gigantic war machines with psionic demigods, and somehow it always feels like you're up against insurmountable odds. If you ask me, this feeling is due to two factors, XCOM 2's great enemy design and its sneaky behind the scenes schedule. Here's the first mission of the game, Operation Gatecrasher. On the default difficulty, Veteran, you're outnumbered 4-6 to six by these advent troopers. Now your chumps, uh, I mean rookies, don't have any real skills here, so the best tactic is to just stick to cover, get the drop on a few enemies and flank to clear up the survivors. You might need to use a grenade or two to kill a hard to reach trooper, but things are usually pretty straightforward. From the very first mission, XCOM instills in you a very basic tactic that will serve you well in the first few missions of the game. Cover, flank, kill. Not following this strategy usually leads to instant death for one or more of your troops. XCOM is pretty unforgiving when it comes to punishing mistakes, so you learn to think about each of your moves very carefully. The addition of sectoids in the next few missions shakes up this simple strategy quite a bit. They can cause your soldiers to panic, wasting an action and drawing them out of position, as well as resurrect fallen troops as tanky zombies. Yeah, all of that is on the third enemy in the game. This makes them kill on sight targets early on. Once your rookies start getting classes, you can begin to turn the tables on the aliens. Rangers let you sprint and attack in the same turn, specialists help you recover from mistakes, sharpshooters can pin down enemies in high cover, and grenadiers can destroy cover and deal damage in an AoE. Better soldiers and better stats means you can start beating these rubbish advent grunts and firefights more easily. So, once you're out of the introductory stages of the game, the aliens turn things up a notch. Purifiers deal AoE damage to stop you clumping up and can explode on death, stopping you from exploiting close range flanks. The Chosen, big nasty boss aliens start to appear and can kidnap your soldiers from the battlefield, as well as being formidable soldiers in their own right. And then there's these sexy sexy snake aliens, aka vipers. They can drag your soldiers out of cover, spit poison over walls and coil people up to take them out of the fight until the viper is dealt with. Vipers are the be all end all counter to the cover based strategy the game teaches you early on, forcing you to improvise and are the moment where the game switches from having one clear optimal strategy to having a variety of viral tactics. For each possible tactic you can employ, the aliens have a counter, and vice versa. This relationship continues as both you and the aliens continue to tech up. Do you invest in reapers and sharpshooters who can deal with enemies at long range before they have the chance to hit you? Well, Advent has priests who can't be killed in a single hit, and mechs, big bulky robots who can take a fair amount of punishment early on as well as destroy the cover protecting your squishy snipers. You want to get up close and personal with skirmishers and sword spec rangers? Meet fancy new XCOM 2 mutons who are completely immune to melee attacks, they'll even counter attack you if you try. Very few tactics games have the same relentless variety as the new XCOM games. Take Fire Emblem. Sure, it's got a bunch of classes, but more than half of them are just better versions of others, and most fall into fairly broad archetypes. Big slow guys, ranged guys, fast mounted guys, melee chumps with a few flavours, and the occasional healer. It's fine, but it becomes very clear early on that the focus of Fire Emblem and other such games isn't on the cast of enemies you'll be facing. Same with something like the brilliant Valkyria Chronicles. Um, it's a hard game to explain, so just think about what if World War II was an anime and you'll have the general gist. Enemy characters are all pretty much just copies of some identical templates. Tanks, anti-tank guys, snipers, machine gunners, scouts, you get the picture. The name for this kind of differentiation between kinds of enemies and game design is called orthogonal design, coined by Harvey Smith of Deus Ex fame. It means that all enemies have different properties to one another, which means that you'll need to learn how to handle each one differently. The challenge of games like this is in mastering how to deal with these enemies in different combinations. In Fire Emblem, this is made very clear with a low key rock, paper, scissors style of combat. Swords beat axes, beat lances, beat swords. Orthogonal design works really well for stuff like Doom, as Mark Brown points out in his fantastic video on the subject. It's a great way to test your mastery of a game, 
when relatively simplistic mechanics are at play, like in an FPS. You can change the level layout or what weapons you have available to you in order to totally recontextualise how you view the same small set of enemies. Thing is, once you've mastered this system, that's about it. It's all a bit static for my liking. New concepts are introduced so rarely and are almost always one-off gimmicks that they don't really change the core strategy. Once you've switched from reacting to the challenges the game poses and have become proactive in anticipating and preparing for them, there's only so much that can be done in order to keep the game fresh. While the numbers may get bigger and the difficulty increases over time, you're still thinking about engagements in the same way. Harder encounters usually means a smaller margin for error, rather than a different thought process entirely. So what makes XCOM different? Well, it still uses the same orthogonal unit design principles as something like Doom, but it turns everything up to 11. First of all, it has way more kinds of enemies, loads more than the 7 or so archetypes you'd see in something like Fire Emblem, none of which have any meaningful crossover, they all do different things. This means you can't generalise your strategy and have to approach each new combination of aliens with a fresh perspective. Normally I'd charge in with my ranger here to kill these soldiers, but I need him to keep tabs on this pack of chrysalids, high damage melee beasties. That means I'm going to have to bring my backline sniper out of position to deal with these stun lancers so I can get a clean shot on the chrysalids. Every XCOM 2 mission is filled with decisions just like this. Second, and more importantly, is that XCOM never really lets you switch from reactive to proactive until the very final stages of the game. The final double bill of missions where you're finally on the offence is a big test of everything you've learned that pits you up against basically every enemy type in the game. Until this point though, it constantly keeps you on the back foot, struggling to deal with all the new stuff it keeps throwing at you. And this is where Firaxis's... Firaxis's? Firaxis? Firaxis? Uh, the people who make XCOM's sneaky schedule comes into play. Did you know that both XCOM 1 and XCOM 2 operate on a roughly 6-7 to seven month schedule? It's true. XCOM 2 starts off in March with only Advent Troopers, Officers and Sectoids present. In April, Vipers, Purifiers, Stun Lancers and Mechs get introduced and… you know what, here's the whole calendar. Note that Advent Troops get an upgrade in May and July respectively. This coincides with when your troops should be upgrading to Magnetic and Plasma Weaponry. This little interaction is a really neat way of hammering home that arms race feel. Managing to nab these upgrades early is an awesome power boost for a little while as you can really cut through advent troops, whereas being behind the power curve puts you on the back foot as you struggle to deal with enemies that are suddenly much tougher. It's not that simple though, XCOM 2 tries as hard as it can to keep you from getting complacent, with researchers taking on average 5 days to a week and missions popping up with around that frequency, every new mission gives you something new to play with or a new modifier to handle. Check this out. In the space of a few missions, I go from fighting Hordes of the Lost, a whole new enemy type introduced in War of the Chosen, to defending the Avenger from Alien Assault, to staging an attack on the Fortress of the Chosen Assassin. Each of these missions pitted me against different configurations of foes and needed completely different squad composition, gear and tactics to survive. Tactics that worked well fighting the Lost, such as funneling them down big firing lines using sharpshooters, are impossible to do fighting the Assassin and would probably have gotten me killed if I'd tried them. A crucial detail that XCOM doesn't tell you is when missions are going to happen, and a large part of the decision making process becomes budgeting your time before you risk getting a mission sprung on you. The original games and Enemy Unknown did this too with the unpredictable terror missions, but 2 stepped this up by having you deal with acquiring time sensitive resources and resistance contacts as well as the usual researches, build times and uh oh, great, a retaliation mission. By constantly changing where you fight as well as how you do it and what you're fighting, XCOM 2 ensures there's no room to get complacent. In the 47 missions I played over the course of the campaign, only 8 of them contain nothing I call a meaningful change to the formula, such as a new alien, a new mission objective or a substantial upgrade for my troops. Without the brutal difficulty of XCOM, backed up by the highly encouraged Iron Man mode which ensures you can't go back on your saves, the game would quickly fall into the execution challenge rhythm of other tactics games, but XCOM constantly interrupts this. The death of a key squad member will hamstring you until a suitable replacement is found. New aliens means new threats, stretching your limited supplies and forcing you to make tough calls. Unlike the previous game in the series, XCOM 2 actually does something quite interesting in regards to keeping you from reaching that point of psychological equilibrium that comes from feeling as if you totally understood the game. It's got not one, but two slowly ticking death clocks. The first is the Avatar Project Countdown, which instantly ends the game when time is up, and there's also the chosen knowledge meters, which also have the potential to end the game early. Now, both of these two are actually really quite easy to avoid in my experience, 
but their presence alone, complete with ominous red glows and constant reminders competing for your attention, is great at instilling that lingering sense of dread that forces you to play differently. Even the facility raid missions or late game chosen attacks, which by that point are quite routine, have an extra edge to them when you consider that losing this mission means not just the setback of a few weeks, but losing the entire game. Messing with players psychologically is a great way to make familiar situations tense and engaging, an honestly pretty middling game that came out recently does this to great effect. Hellblades send you a sacrifice claims that too many deaths will lead to a game over. Spoilers, that's not actually true, but the fact you think it is makes you play the game differently and turns what's actually a pretty bland third person action game into a game with sky high stakes. Eh, I mean, maybe I'm being a bit harsh to Hellblade, the psychological stuff is actually really maturely handled and it's easily the best bit of the game. Fire Emblem does this kind of psychological manipulation too. In fact, it arguably does it way better than XCOM. The characters aren't random, they all have distinct personalities and arcs, and in some of the games you can even hook them up with each other. Getting attached to these characters means you'll play suboptimally trying to protect your favourites. Yeah, the game holds your waifus for ransom. Sure, a fight with some bandits isn't anything special, but when best boy Kent's life is on the line, it presents a new challenge that the player has to consider. Anyway, back to XCOM. At its most fundamental, XCOM 2 is oppressive, and that, weirdly, is a good thing. By never letting you rest and settle into a comfortable gameplay loop, XCOM manages to make a 20 hour campaign feel fresh right until the end, by combining challenge with a barrage of new content and modifiers. Me waxing lyrical about why I love XCOM is all well and good, but it contains some key lessons that we can use in other games. I think the idea of a game not pulling its punches is a welcome change from a lot of recent titles, especially AAA ones being easy and pretty bland. XCOM is unrepentingly ruthless at times, and that's something we really only see in roguelikes and this weird new genre I'm going to call souls em ups The difficulty and complexity of these games is crucial to evoke a certain mindset in the player, and to remove either of those factors would be to totally neuter them. Imagine if Spelunky let you restart from the beginning of the floor if you died, it would be a totally different game and much worse off for it. Similarly with mechanical complexity. Too many games have this trend where they blow their load halfway through the game and don't really expand upon the systems they've introduced. Trine 2's character swapping gimmick is interesting enough to carry the whole game, but it's never really explored to its fullest, instead choosing to present the player with boring physics puzzles and drab combat. Contrast that with something like Portal, which has a single main mechanic explored to its greatest extent to create a much more rewarding experience. XCOM 2 in particular navigates a huge breadth of design space with its aliens even though it could have easily shipped with half that number. This allows them to keep even seasoned players guessing, as there's just that much more of the game to comprehend. XCOM teaches us that it's okay to have a punishing and ruthless game, so long as underneath that difficulty are well-realised mechanics and interesting ways to tackle the challenges the game presents. More tactics games should spend a few days in the lab performing an autopsy on previous XCOM games. They might learn something valuable- OH WHAT THE HELL! HE WAS IN FULL COVER! HE WAS ON FULL HEALTH! Alright, I'm done. I'm out of here. Screw this game. Hey everyone, Architect here. Just a quick update to apologise for the slightly late release on this one. I try and have these videos done in around 10 days apiece, and this one kind of needed a few more rewrites before I was happy with it. I'll be headed away from home for a week to do some work, so I won't be able to do much video work in that time, so expect the next episode to be a little bit late as well. Oh, I guess, sorry for spoilers in this Dark Souls 3 footage I'm using. I mean, it's been out for ages. Snoozy lose on that one, I'm afraid. Oh, uh, before I forget, a special thank you to Mark Brown himself for pointing this video in the right direction. It was a huge help, and, uh, you know, it's not like he needs any more publicity, so just, you know, like him even more than you inevitably already do. Uh, but, even more importantly, thank you to you for watching this video. And I will see you around. Bye!